Well, my name is Stephanie Tuning, and I am the Education Coordinator at 100 Miles, and welcome to Naturals 101. As you know, due to COVID, all of our programs have moved to digitally. However, that doesn't mean that we don't have a whole slew of programs that are um, for you to watch. So you can visit our website to see other Naturalist 101s, as well as our Family and Nature programs. Those are also being recorded and those are live on Facebook. And we have one of those on Thursday of next week. Um, but again, we couldn't do any of our programming without our members and also our sponsors. So thank, thank you if you're already a member or sponsor for 100 Miles. I want to introduce our speaker for this evening. Kate Tweedy is here with us. She is the Ecology Coordinator at Little St. Simons. She has been there since 2007 and she has a degree um, in biology and wildlife conservation from Virginia Tech. So without any further ado, let's welcome Kate to for tonight. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for that introduction. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. And again, my name is Kate and I look forward to uh, communicating you, with you this evening and answering any questions you might have about what we're up to over on Little St. Simons Island. So my objective with my talk tonight is to give you more insight into the conservation and research work that we're doing over on Little St. Simons Island. And I'm really excited to speak with you about this tonight. So I'm gonna jump right into it. So just to start off really briefly talking about Little St. Simons Island, we are of course one of the 14 barrier islands on the coast of Georgia. And we're located right off the north and east side of St. Simons Island. So this is us right here. Little St. Simons Island is 11,000 acres in size. It is privately owned, but the owners of the island have placed the entire property into a conservation easement held by the Nature Conservancy. So while we're privately owned, uh, this land has been protected in perpetuity, so we're never going to develop this land beyond its current state. And I will say too that the history of human influence or disturbance on the land is really minimal here, so we have a really great ecologically intact system on LSSI. So to zoom out from that just a little bit, um, talking about the conservation of LSSI, We've already done one of the biggest things that we could do to ensure that this land is always productive, that this is always an ecologically sound place by placing this conservation easement protection on Little St. Simons Island. But you will definitely notice a theme in my talk tonight as I'm speaking about LSSI because truly, while we are really thoughtful about the projects and management that we do on LSSI, uh, really we're always keeping in mind that we are just a piece in this big patchwork quilt of conservation properties throughout coastal Georgia. So this map right here is just showing you many, many individual tracts of conserved land along the Altamaha River that have been coming together over the years to create a great conservation corridor in the lower Altamaha with Little St. Simons right here where the Altamaha reaches the ocean. And so within the Altamaha Delta, and then of course all along the string of barrier islands of Georgia, uh, there's a lot of collaboration and a lot of information sharing to ensure that we're all being responsible stewards of this awesome region of the United States. So that's just a little bit of big picture stuff, but I'll go ahead and get on into what is actually at Little St. Simons Island. So many people are familiar with the Eco Lodge that operates on LSSI. So this is a way for visitors to come stay on the island as guests and go out on activities with our naturalist staff. So all of our staff members and especially the naturalists are really well trained and really knowledgeable about the ecology of this region and how important and special it is. So guests to the island who pay to come stay at our lodge can go out fishing and hiking, kayaking, biking, beachcombing, all the while accompanied with really knowledgeable folks who are really passionate about this place. So you kind of get this great immersive experience in what's best about 
the low country, what's best about uh, the barrier islands of Georgia. But so on the flip side of that, we also have a center for, a center for coastal conservation here on Little St. Simons Island. And this is the side of things that I work on. So this is kind of an, a new branding for us. Uh, we're recently starting to call ourselves the Center for Coastal Conservation. So you might be familiar with the ecological department at LSSI. This is just us uh, working to better encapsulate the work that we're doing and calling this a center really helps us to better communicate with the public and with other professionals about the really legitimate conservation work that we're doing here on LSSI. So, the center and the Eco Lodge definitely go hand in hand to ultimately create this great model for sustainable ecotourism and for uh, a way that an organization like the center can be grounded on this island, grounded on a property, but use its resources to collaborate on a larger scale regionally. So tonight I'll be talking about our Center for Coastal Conservation at Little St. Simons Island. And specifically, I'll talk about our vision and give you some examples of what we're doing here. So our vision is to work with partners to advance coastal, to advance coastal conservation at Little St. Simons Island and throughout coastal Georgia through these four things, land and wildlife stewardship, research, education and outreach, and regional leadership. So my talk tonight is going to be focusing on talking briefly about each of these four areas of our concentration. And then I'm mostly just going to be giving you some examples or illustrations of projects that we've done in each of these four areas so that you can really get a sense of what we're up to over here on Little St. Simons Island and also very importantly, how we're relating this LSSI work on a larger scale within coastal Georgia. So to start off with, I'll talk about land and wildlife stewardship. So the photos on this slide are just giving you a little sampling of examples of land and wildlife stewardship that we're doing. And so there's a big story behind each one of these photos, uh, but I'll, I'll just be giving you one illustration tonight of how we are really thoughtfully trying to take light-handed management efforts on the ground here at LSSI, how we're monitoring our habitats, our ecology, our species, and then how we're learning from what our management practices are and we're constantly informing and updating what we're doing here at LSSI. And then obviously a lot of that work is really applicable to other barrier islands and other natural resource managers within our region. So we're sharing a lot of information too. So I'll jump right into an illustration of this kind of work. So uh, we do a lot of work with shorebirds on LSSI. Uh, the coast of Georgia is actually a, this is a quote, a landscape of hemispheric importance for shorebirds. So truly, truly many, many species, whether they're breeding here, wintering here, or just migrating through our area, coastal Georgia has a lot to offer for shorebirds. And I think this is especially timely because shorebirds are also a, a group of wildlife that scientists are paying a lot of attention to right now because they are very closely tied to coastlines, to water resources, and they, that, that way they serve as a great indicator of overall ecosystem health. So an example of that on LSSI specifically is our work with the American oyster catcher, one of our uh, shorebird species. So they're uh, really recognizable and charismatic species, and they're really kind of a great ambassador for shorebird work. So we have oyster catchers nesting on LSSI each summer, and we are able to do a really great amount of monitoring with this species to try to understand what is working for them, what's making them successful here. And if there are issues, we wanna identify those issues so that we can maybe take some management action to be really responsible stewards for these uh, special species of concern. 
So we've been monitoring the nesting oyster catchers for 12 years now. And over the course of these years, as you can see in this table at the top of my slide, we've had varying levels of success with our oyster catcher nesting. We've had some years where the oyster catchers did really good and some years where they seem to struggle. And now that we've built up this fairly sizable data set, we're really able to dig into understanding some of these trends with them and seeing what, might, what we might be able to do to help them do better. And definitely we've had some lessons learned. So I'm gonna talk about coyotes. We uh, do not have coyotes typically on the island. They're not native to this region of the world but they've definitely been expanding their range and they're present on many, in many coastal areas in Georgia now, uh, but they don't necessarily um, belong here. And that was definitely the case that we found out at LSSI where we did not have coyotes, but then one was confirmed to have swam over to our island in early 2011. And since it was a new scenario for us and we, kind of wanted to take our time and understand, okay, what are the impacts that this species is going to have now that it's here? We had a really hands-off approach at first. We just wanted to watch and wait and see how the coyotes did and see if, um, you know, we really, we really wanted to be informed before we made any kind of management decision on them. So this is where the oyster catchers come in. In 2011, the coyotes arrived on the island. So this graph is showing you the years that we've been monitoring our nesting oyster catchers. And on the y-axis is the number of nests, uh, oyster catcher nests that we've lost to various predator sources. So that would be things like raccoons and coyotes that would eat the eggs in an oyster catcher nest. And so what we learned through our ongoing monitoring with the oyster catchers is that when coyotes first arrived on the island, which was in 2011, their presence as a dominant predator seemed to scare the raccoons away from the beach. And we had a few years of pretty good success for our oyster catchers where predation numbers were low. We were losing relatively few nests of predators. Um, and we kind of attribute, it, attribute that to the coyotes being present and scaring away the raccoons. So the raccoons just weren't on the beach as much and they weren't eating the oyster catcher eggs as much. But after the coyotes have been here for a few years, by 2014, they suddenly really figured out that the, the oyster catcher nests were out there and they were potentially a good food resource. So in 2014 and 2015, our oyster catchers really struggled because the coyotes got real smart and they were really just hammering our um, nesting success for the oyster catchers. So it was at that time, because we were carefully monitoring this, it was at that time that we had an informed opinion that we were aware that the coyotes were really having a bad effect on one of our protected species, one of the species that we're really trying to conserve here. So we made the decision that the coyotes needed to go and over the course of a couple of years, we removed, uh, eventually we removed all of the coyotes from the island. So in 2017, there were no more coyotes, but then this really interesting thing happened, which I think kind of makes sense based on the um, predator dynamics out here that I was mentioning with the raccoons. Suddenly, once the coyotes were gone, the raccoons had a field day and they ate tons of oyster catcher nests. So we had some more lessons learned here where uh, it, became apparent that we needed to figure out a way to have some light-handed management of our problem raccoons, probably just those few that got wise to the oyster catcher nests out there and started eating eggs. If we could uh, develop some management strategy with these raccoon populations, then um, we could continue seeing good success for our oyster catchers. So now this graph that I'm showing is sort of the flip side of that story where over the years that we've been monitoring our oyster catcher nesting. Um, this graph is showing you the number of chicks that we've fledged. So this is our mark of success. This is the number of young baby oyster catchers that get to the point where they're flying on their own, they're independent from their parents. We, that, that is our mark of success. That's how we're gauging the success of our efforts and uh, of, our, of our oyster catchers on our beaches. 
So this graph is just showing you the number of fledglings that we've produced each year. And so by 2018, when we had removed the coyotes, but then we were also starting to figure out how to manage our raccoon interactions on the beach, we started seeing some years, record-breaking years of really high success. So 2018 was really great, 10 oyster catchers fledged. And then again in 2020, we had 16 oyster catcher fledglings produced on Ellis Asai. So this year was our real record breaker and it was a really fantastic story um, to kind of be able to illustrate and tell this narrative about the oyster catchers and how we've been monitoring them and we've had these lessons learned from observing the coyotes interactions, observing the raccoons. So now what we're intending to do with this information is continue refining our management strategies on the ground here at LSSI, but we're also actively working on some management recommendations and a management plan more or less for how other natural resource managers in our region could be approaching, thinking about predator control, approaching predator control to ultimately um, take some, some guiding management to see greater success for a species of conservation concern like the oyster catcher. So this has been an exciting process for us and a, definitely a big learning process and we're excited to be getting more of this information out to other coastal resource managers. So that narrative of the oyster catchers is an example of our land and wildlife stewardship actions. So on to the next topic, talking about research. So this is when we're partnering with other organizations, oftentimes graduate students or professors at a university to help us investigate some of our big high priority research questions that are gonna allow us to be better stewards of this landscape, um, but then also those researchers go on to publish scientific literature. Ultimately, they're contributing to a, an expanding body of scientific knowledge. So my example of this uh, research facet of our work is going to be this really awesome armadillo study that we've done with the University of Georgia. So armadillos, they are Again, not native to the southeastern U.S. They were introduced around the mid-1900s, and then they've been gradually expanding their range up out of Florida. They've been in Georgia for a number of decades, and we know that they only arrived on LSSI in about the 1980s. So they're a relatively new arrival on the scene for us, and we have been really interested in, for a while about understanding how the armadillos might be affecting our native ecology here because they've definitely inserted themselves into kind of found a niche here and and we really want to know if they're having a net positive or a net negative impact before we decide to take any kind of management action so we partnered with a graduate student at the university of georgia to do this really exciting study for us to help answer these big picture questions we have. So this graduate student used game cameras posted on these mounts above and positioned above armadillo burrows so that as animals, the armadillos themselves or any other animals were coming and going, uh, this game camera would capture photos of them so we could identify them. So we were thinking that this would be a great method for understanding hey, we have this uh, fossorial species out here now, this armadillo, where uh, like a lot of the younger barrier islands and most of the barrier islands, we don't have gopher tortoises. We don't really have uh, an animal out here naturally that makes these burrows. So we, we figured we wanted to uh, investigate further these armadillo burrows, thinking that maybe our native animals would be taking advantage of that new micro habitat on the landscape. And that was definitely the case. So with those game cameras, we caught some really interesting evidence of a lot of our native species going into the burrows. They were there for thermal refuge. That's especially the case for a lot of our snake species. They would go into the burrows to shelter from the heat of the summer or the cool of the winter. Um, many other species were going in there 
to um, find food we found. So uh, this really cool graph is just representing to you the animals that we saw most often interacting with armadillo burrows. And here on the x-axis, we're just showing out of all of the photo captures we got of various animals interacting with the burrows, um, what proportion of those photos is attributed to each species. So which species were seen going to the burrows the most. And so the nine-banded armadillo is right here. They were using the burrows about one-fifth of the time we saw animals using the burrows. But really interestingly, the hispid cotton rat was using the burrows even more than the armadillos themselves. And then this third bar of most use is the uh, eastern, di eastern diamondback rattlesnake. And so they are a really, really important apex predator in our grassland and shrubland type habitats on the island. So we were really interested to see how the diamondback rattlesnakes were coming and going from the armadillo burrows a lot, much as they've been documented utilizing the gopher tortoise burrows out over on the mainland. So this was a really awesome illustration of how our wildlife found these burrows and used them and seemed to benefit from them. So here's just one really cool photo of a Carolina wren going to the apron or the opening of an armadillo burrow and it was picking up spiders and insects from that disturbed soil. So it really seemed to be gaining some kind of benefit from it. So that was a really good thing that we learned um, that we maybe suspected, but we were able to confirm through this research that the armadillos were creating this habitat, this structure on the landscape that didn't really exist here otherwise, and our wildlife actually used it. But uh, we still really wanted to understand the flip side of that, see if there were possibly negative consequences for the armadillos here. So this graduate student also did a really great investigation for us using the sea turtle data from seaturtle.org, which many of the Georgia barrier islands enter all of their sea turtle nesting information into in real time. So this is a huge data set for many of the islands. And this graduate student was able to take this nesting information from sea turtles, which are naturally a, a very important species, a species of conservation concern for the coastal Georgia community. Uh, we looked at this high priority species and tried to look at the relative impacts that various predators were having on sea turtle nesting. So this is a cool graph. There's a lot going on here. I'm just going to point out a few things where here on the x-axis we have egg loss frequency. So this is the number of instances when a particular predator was documented taking eggs from a sea turtle nest. And then on the y-axis is the average number of eggs that were lost per loss event. So this is showing you that raccoons, for example, were a really frequent predator of uh, sea turtle eggs. And they also took a decently large number of eggs each time, over 30 eggs usually per predation event. And then I'll point out another predator here, the feral hog, which are not on all of the barrier islands, but areas where they are established, they can be extremely detrimental to sea turtle nesting. So the hogs were not taking as many nests, but when they did take a nest, they were often destroying almost the entire clutch in a single event. So that's extremely destructive. And counter that with the armadillo, which is down here. The armadillo is um, only taking a few nests and it's taking 20 to 30 eggs per predation event. So that's not necessarily a negligible impact, but when you compare that to another invasive species like the feral hog, you can see that um, resource managers as they're deciding which, which predators, which threats to sea turtle nests they're going to put resources into, that they're going to really focus and put staff time or money into. The hog is definitely a much higher priority for management action than the armadillo. So this was a reassuring thing for us to get some concrete numbers on for us to really learn and see. So um, 
ultimately what we've learned from this partnership with this UGA graduate student is that yes, armadillos are having positive impacts and uh, yes, from at least this one instance of the sea turtle investigation, armadillos don't, be, don't seem to be a very high priority threat that we might be concerned with managing. So this definitely is not the end all. Uh, we're definitely gonna keep our eyes on the armadillos and probably have some follow-up studies just so we can continue understanding their dynamics here because it's, it's definitely a really big topic. But so far, this has really answered our immediate pressing concern. Do we need to manage armadillos? For us right now, the answer is no. So excitingly, this graduate student is publishing management recommendations and uh, you know synopses of the work that he's done and interpreting that for resource managers throughout the Southeast. And he's publishing some really great scientific literature also. So this was a great way for LSSI to pose this research question and work with a research institution, UGA, to uh, answer our immediate question, but of course to then put more scientific knowledge out there into the world where others can access it. All right, next topic, education and outreach. So I've been talking a lot about work that we're sort of doing on the ground here at LSSI, but it's equally important to us that we're connecting with people, connecting with people in the coastal landscape here. And certainly the naturalists at the Eco Lodge on LSSI do a fantastic job of giving each guest to the island a, an awesome immersive experience and educating them about what's really special about coastal Georgia. But beyond that, we feel like at the center, we also have a role to play where we're able to use our, our time and our resources to further the conservation objectives of some of our, our volunteers and our partners. So my example here is going to be the Butterflies of the Atlantic Flyway Alliance, which is a really awesome project or initiative that I've fortunately gotten to take a, a leadership role in. So just a little bit of background about why we were interested in studying butterflies. And then I'll tell you about how I've, I've been able to use my resources to help guide and shape this initiative. So um, monarchs are a really well understood butterfly species. They have been studied throughout the United States and we have a really great understanding and appreciation for their migratory routes, the resources they're relying on, this spectacular migration that they undertake each year. However, there are many other migratory butterfly species that we know relatively little about. So species like this Gulf fritillary here, which if you're in coastal Georgia, you should definitely be seeing a lot of these guys flying along right now, heading south for the winter. Um, and species like the cloudless sulfur, we really think that in coastal Georgia, where many of these butterflies migrate through, we need to get a better understanding of how these butterflies are doing, what habitats and resources they're relying on. We wanna know their importance to coastal Georgia. And also we wanna know how coastal Georgia is important for them. So uh, several years ago, I got involved with this budding idea to create this Butterflies of the Atlantic Flyway Initiative. Um, and I'll call this BAFA. So uh, Butterflies of the Atlantic Flyway Alliance is BAFA. This is our organization. So I, I was really excited to get involved with these ideas about, okay, we, we need more information about butterflies. What are we going to do about this? And ultimately, we ended up developing some survey protocols for uh, both migration counts and for nectar and habitat assessments so that ultimately we structured this so that we could train volunteers, train up citizen scientists to go out and do these studies for us throughout coastal Georgia. And this has been such a rewarding partnership and experience where uh, each year we're bringing on new land managers or new properties or new areas of coastal Georgia and training volunteers, giving them workshops, getting them excited about looking for native pollinators and these migratory butterflies. 
Um, and so really excitingly, we're, uh, this is their, our third year of really consistent data collection. And uh, I, I feel really fortunate that I've been able to use some of my expertise that I've gotten to, develop, gotten to develop through my work on LSSI. I've been able to lend that out into the broader coastal Georgia community. And I'm, I'm helping to train volunteers, connecting people with their survey sites. And uh, ultimately, you know, each time we, we get a new volunteer into this project and get new people coming through our training workshops on how to how to look for these butterflies, how to survey them. We're, we're creating advocates for pollinator health, advocates for natural resources in coastal Georgia. We're getting people excited about going out and looking for these things. So I've found that that's been a really rewarding uh, part of my role in this organization. Um, really just, uh, you know, getting people excited and they're, they're going to be ambassadors for um, for butterflies and oftentimes these are the same people who once they're involved in one organization or another then they're going to be getting involved with more and more so they're going to join coastal wildscapes they're going to join 100 miles um, so I think this is a really great way that I've been able to expand some of my activities and lend some help to the BAFA project help coordinate things and um, ultimately uh, you know, spread some really good information and knowledge gathering throughout coastal Georgia. So we're definitely looking for more sites to join our study. And we're always looking to uh, engage with some new folks and new volunteers too. So if you're interested in learning more about BAFA, I'll have my email address posted at the end of my program too. So that feel free to reach out to me about that. And we've reached our final topic now, which is regional leadership. So this is a way for Little St. Simons Island where our staff members have our, our roots, you know, we're grounded here, but we are seeking to take an active role in guiding and shaping conservation leadership regionally. So this means that we're sometimes joining the board of other conservation organizations or we're taking a really active role in working groups and you know, sharing a lot of our lessons learned and sharing our um, information. So again, this is just a way for us to help, help out the broader coastal conservation community. And my example here is that I've, I've in the last year joined the board of the Coastal Audubon Society. And this has been a really awesome experience for me because I'm really passionate about birds and I really, really get excited telling other people about how awesome bird watching is, how cool it is to go out and appreciate these animals and appreciate their migrations and how awesome their ecology is. So I was excited to join the board of Coastal Georgia Audubon Society. I've been able to use some of my time and resources to uh, build a new website for them and we're, uh, I'm helping to plan some of our fall programming and outreach events. So it looks really different from this photo right now that I'm showing on the screen. Uh, unfortunately, we can't be doing um, hands-on learning workshops like this with school-age kids or with members of the coastal community. But I look forward to getting back to that in the future. But even so, there's definitely something to be said about during these pandemic times, um, just staying involved, staying engaged, tuning in for presentations like what I'm doing right now, because, you know, we never stop learning and we never stop um, seeking out uh, more ways to appreciate our coastal Georgia area and to be involved with it. So um, through serving on the board with Coastal Georgia Audubon Society, that's kind of another way for me with my roots on the LSSI to give back and be more engaged and sharing resources with broader coastal conservation community. So that was a lot of talking. <laughs> that was a lot of information, uh, but I'd just like to try to sum this up for you um, and just bring all those ideas and projects back together here at the end, where um, ultimately our vision is that we're grounded here on LSSI. The, the Center for Coastal Conservation is grounded in conservation principles. We, we have our roots here on LSSI. 
but we intend to set a model for advancing conservation both here and throughout coastal Georgia. And we're doing that through taking active roles in, in research, in stewardship, in outreach, and through um, regional leadership. So this has been a great undertaking and we're uh, looking forward to all the new projects that we're forming. We're, we're constantly wrapping things up and lining up new work to do. Um, and it's a really exciting process. So I'm excited too for all of y'all to know now a little bit more about what goes on at LSSI. And if you come to visit us on a day trip or if you come stay as an overnight guest in the lodge, just know that your stay here is gonna be really immersive and really rewarding, but you're also gonna be helping to sustain the work that the center does so that we can ensure LSSI is a great uh, ecological and biodiversity preserve forever, but also that we're making good use of this great opportunity we have with the natural resources of LSSI. We're learning what we need to, and we're sharing that throughout the, the broader region. So I, I think that kind of wraps up the messaging that I'm trying to do here. And now I'd just really love to answer any questions. And again, my um, email address is up here at the top. So if you had anything more specific you wanted to talk about, or if you wanted to reach out on any of these projects that I was talking about, feel, feel free to send me an email. Well, thank you so much, Katie, for, uh, sorry, Kate, for this presentation. Um, so if you are wanting to ask any questions, um, you can do that by typing them into um, the boxes, either the chat or the question and answer boxes at the bottom of your page. Um, but actually, I had a question listening, um, so I'll get started. Great. You're talking about the butterfly survey. Is there a certain plant that you've noticed that um, the butterflies are needing, are going to the most, or seems to be the most important for them on the coast that we could actually have in our own yards? Oh yes, yeah, absolutely. So, at least from my personal experience going out and doing surveys here on LSSI, um, we see that a lot of the butterflies of all the species we're paying attention to. They're using this plant called sweet scent. Uh, another name for it is camphor weed. That doesn't sound quite as nice. I call it sweet scent, but the scientific name is Pluchia odorata. So it's the, the smelly camphor weed, um, but it's this gorgeous purple flowering plant that in my experience is flowering throughout the fall season from almost the time we start our surveys in mid-August until things are wrapping up in mid-November. So it blooms for a really long time. It's a really beautiful color. And it, with it being native and naturally occurring here on the coast, it should be a pretty hardy plant to, uh, it pretty, um, it, it should do pretty well around uh, houses. So say if you wanted to plant this plant in your backyard, it should do pretty well. Awesome, I will definitely look for it. <laughs> So is there any other questions that anyone has about the work on Little Saints? So oh, uh, here comes one. Um, this comes from Wendy. Can you describe uh, a bit more detail about volunteering for the, well, oh, sorry, a little more detail of what the volunteers do for the butterfly survey? Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to describe more about what the but butterfly volunteers do when they go out to monitor. So our volunteers are essentially just members of the community who would uh, really like to learn more about these butterflies, about the pollinators of coastal Georgia. So uh, really if you're motivated and you're interested to get out into the field and see some of these animals and start to get firsthand appreciation for their role here in our ecology, then um, you'd be a really great candidate for being a, a butterfly volunteer. So what you do uh, most simply is you would join in with a training workshop that we offer at the beginning of the fall migration, fall migration season. So this is usually in July or early August. Um, so we give all of our volunteers a refresher on how to go out and count the butterflies. And then you would partner up with one of our partner sites, one of the barrier islands, or we have a couple of mainland locations too. 
And um, the, the coordinator for that site would just set a day of the week that you come out and do the monitoring. And then you come out and you um, are counting butterflies. So uh, essentially the data that the butterfly volunteers are gathering is going to be used ultimately to inform some management recommendations. So I'm talking about, um, we're knowing whether our butterfly populations are stable, we're getting tipped off if some of them are declining or we need to pay more uh, acute attention to any of them. And then we're gonna be publishing some recommendations for um, what plants to use on a small scale, right in your backyard, up to management recommendations for um, you know, coastal resource managers that might have hundreds or thousands of acres that they're caring for. So the butterflies are just one part of the equation for managing land, but I definitely think it's important for us to be informed about them through all of the citizen science and, and to know how to balance the needs of the butterflies with everything else we have going on in coastal Georgia. Awesome, we just got another question in, um, but first it said, thank you, what a great presentation. Um, the question is, are there hogs on Little St. Simons? We constantly have them in the news here in Missouri, and I know it's a real conservation struggle. Yes, yeah, that's absolutely a great question. And feral hogs are definitely um, a huge concern throughout coastal Georgia. Um, so for Little St. Simons Island specifically, uh, we fortunately do not have an established population of feral hogs. So they're not currently living here but we are always on the alert for them swimming over to our island from some neighboring areas where they are established. So we recognize that they can be extremely detrimental to native biodiversity and native ecology. And so we're, we're definitely on the alert and we work hard to keep their population as close to zero as possible on LSSI. Good. Um, I don't have any more questions for you right now, but thank you again so much for taking your time to teach us more about all the research happening on Little St. Simons. Um, and I will put a plug if you have not taken a day trip or stayed out there. It is a wonderful um, place to visit. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to do a field trip out there again soon. Um, but I want to thank everyone who participated um, tonight. We couldn't do it without you guys. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I just want to also plug our next Naturalist 101 for November. It is called Shifting Sands, the Geology of Cumberland Island National Seashore. And that will be done by um, an one of the interpreter rangers out there named Rob Robin Barker. So you can sign up again through our website um, and join us next month for that. But until then, we hope to see you soon and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Have a good evening.